on use of Cerecia lesvedisa as a low input tannin rich perennial legume as a natural dewormer for sheep and goats. He also teaches and mentors several graduate students each semester in the animal science um, master's program at Fort Valley State University. We're very privileged to have you here today and looking forward here. to your talk. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dalio. I am uh, really pleased to be here. Uh, I think Virginia is one of the most beautiful states anywhere. I really, <laughs> and it's a beautiful day today. So, But uh, uh, I really enjoyed the talk so far. And what, what I'm not going to be talking about today is uh, how, where this plant is adapted and how to produce it and so forth. And so if, if you need information on that, it, it actually builds on all the talks that were given earlier today. And, and I really like what, uh, what uh, um, Chris said, which was that th this plant, like any plant, is it, there's nothing magic about it. You know, you can't make a, you can't make forage without some sort of fertilizer, and you can't establish lespedeza without some weed, some kind of weed control. And you know, even though it is tolerant of ac acid soils and so forth, and so, and it's also um, what they asked me to speak on was its use for parasite control. And so I'm going to mainly focus on this plant, but there's a whole lot of, uh, I mean, if y'all work with small ruminants, you know you need to have parasite control. And hopefully you know that just using anthemintic drugs is not the answer because of drug resistance. And so sustainable parasite control is a combination of different things. And this is just one tool in that. Uh, but and I'll, I'll give a web, website a little bit later on for our consortium where you can get all the information on all the different uh, ways that you can control parasites. But Cerecia lespedeza is a, is a <coughs> excuse me, it's a warm season perennial legume, as, as Chris mentioned earlier. Uh, originally, um, it is it was from China, Australia region. It's, um, <coughs> there are some native North American lespedezas, but they're not nearly as productive as uh, Cerecia. This is the, the parts of the country where it's mainly productive, and you can see Virginia is right in the middle of, the middle of that. And it's also got potential for the West Coast. It's not grown there a lot so far, but this, this was based on uh, rainfall and, and acidity and, and places where, where it's really got potential, and this is where it's mainly grown right now. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also produced in many places throughout the world. It's extremely productive in southern Africa, and we've actually got, it's got a lot of potential to help farmers in that part of the world. And of course, it's from China and Australia, so it's also productive over there. Uh, just, just wanted to give a little bit of background where it came from. Like I say, it came from China, introduced to the United States in 1896. Um, it was more of an ornamental at that time. There wasn't a whole lot of interest in it. Um, in the 1920s, it started having interest for uh, conservation use and was actually widely planted throughout most of the South for road bank stabilization. And if you go out in a summer day, you'll find Lespedeza growing in most of the roads in, throughout the South. And because it drops its leaves, and so it actually builds um, organic matter in the soil. Um, like I say, it was widely seeded for, in the Southeast from the 1930s to the 1950s. The, the original plant was kind of a wild plant that had uh, thick stems and high tannins, and it, was, it did have some uh, use as a forage. It was known historically as poor man's alfalfa because it'll, it'll grow under minimal, you know, I mean, it'll, it'll tolerate acidity, you know, it's drought tolerant and so forth, but, uh, <clears throat> but it wasn't a real high quality forage. And so they started a breeding program at Auburn, as Chris mentioned, uh, actually back in the 50s, and they started uh, the first thing they did was, was reduce the, the stem thickness um, so it'd be more palatable. And so they came out with, with some, um, oops, these like Sorala and, and Interstate were, were thinner stems. And then they reduced the tannin content in the 80s. And then around 1987, they came out, or 1997, they came out with a, a grazable, grazing tolerant type. And that's the one that's commercially available now. I mean, you still find some common Cerecia uh, sold for wildlife and so forth, but uh, as far as a, a pasture, uh, AU Grazer is the one that's available. And 
I'll show you the, the contact information for Simmons Brothers. So they're the only ones that sell it. Uh, that's a, a company in Alabama. So today, a lot of the older cultivars are still used for stabilizing soils from surface mine coal sites, uh, road banks, other disturbed eroding sites, you know, western Virginia, uh, eastern Kentucky. You know, it's, you go to some of those, those, those strip mine sites, Lespedeza is everywhere. I mean, it was planted decades ago, and it's still there. So, um, common Lespedeza is growing on thousands of acres in the Midwestern states where they don't actually want it, but, it, but it's there. And so I, I see that as a, as a potential source of leaf meal and, and you know, things that I'm going to talk about later. And so that's, if somebody gets out there with a, with a, a hay, you know, to cut it for hay or shake the leaves off, or you know, that, there's different things you can do. But AU Grazer is the primary cultivar planted as a grazing and hay crop now. These are some of the historical and still uh, agronomic advantages of Lespedeza. It grows on a wide range of soil types. Um, Georgia, it's extremely well adapted. We have a lot of clay and clay loam soils with an acid subsoil, and it, it loves that. It just, you know, it'll grow right through that acid that subsoil, so it'll go down quite deep. And so even, you know, I I've, I've have years where our Bermuda grass and everything else we have is brown and the Lespedeza is still green because it, it, um, it doesn't mind the acidity. But as Chris said, it does, um, it needs no nitrogen fertilization, but it does need some phosphorus and P and K. And, you know, I really think there's, you know, based, based on the, some of that data that Chris was showing this morning, that we need to, to relook at some of the historical studies and see what's, you know, where the economic benefit is of, of increasing some of the fertility. Even though it is tolerant of low fertility, tolerant of low uh, acidity, you know, if you're going to be selling it as an anthem at decay, say, you know, that's, that's, that could be a high dollar value, and so it may be worth more to, to start fertilizing it more. And so that's <clears throat> probably need to look at the economics and, and re revisit some of those studies. So it's drought tolerant once it's established. It's a small seed, so it is challenging to get established. You know, it's just like any small seed, you know, and you need to keep it close to the soil surface and make sure that there's water when the, when the plants come up so they don't desiccate. But once it's established, it'll, it'll be there. And that's, it'll grow um, and compete well with most things that are out there. I think because of the tannins, there's uh, insect damage is normally minimal. Disease problems are minimal. And it has this tendency to shed its lower leaves. And that's improved soil fertility and soil structure and reduces soil erosion. And, and that was its main function, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago. These are some of the different forms. Uh, you can graze it as fresh forage, cut it and dry it as hay. Uh, you can uh, make it into leaf meal. Uh, this is what the, the guys in <clears throat> at Sims Brothers actually cut it for hay and then shake the leaves off and blow the leaves into a bin and make uh, pellets from just the leaves. Was that the leaves are higher in protein and that's where most of the tannin is. And I'll talk about that in a minute, how, how that's, that's the, the um, compound that, that gives it all of its anthemitic properties. We can also ensile it. And this is something we've been looking at just the last... Um, year or two, that it's making small batch silage as a way to preserve more of the leaves. Because normally when you cut it for hay, the leaves dry very, very quickly, and you leave a lot of them in the field when you, when you pick it up for hay. Uh, this is just some dry matter production, uh, three to four tons per hay in Georgia. You know, like I said, this, this probably needs to be revisited uh, if we can increase that with a, with a little more fertility. And this is what my the colleagues there at, at Alabama were saying. They get about two tons per acre of leaf meal from uh, Cerise Lespedeza. How it is in Virginia, uh, I'm not sure. Like I said, I, um, I think, I think there, there was some old data from Virginia Tech that, that had uh, Lespedeza productivity for this region, but uh, I'd have to look that up. <laughs> Nutritional value, like you say, historically it was considered a moderate, uh, moderately nutritional forage. Uh, without, it's improved a lot, digestibility's improved, 
uh, because of, of lower stems, a, you know, a key for, for nutrition. And I think, uh, I think it was Chris that mentioned this, that, you know, it's, you know, unlike alfalfa, which, which goes into bloom and you can tell when you're supposed to cut it for hay, Lespedeza just keeps growing. And so it's more of a height, you know, your ideal height for grazing is, you know, you start at eight to 10 inches and then, you know, for hay it's 18 to 20 inches. But if you get, a, you know, it'll grow up three or four feet tall. Uh, by that time, it's got thick stems and a, a lot of the palatability is reduced. And that's a lot of the, the digestibility and palatability issues could be solved if we cut it off for hay, if it's getting too tall, and then let it regrow. Because animals do, you know, that they'll, they take a while to get used to it. Sheep and cattle do, grazing it. But if you cut it for hay, they'll eat it. And that was my PhD work, was to figure out why that was. But uh, they'll, every, everything eats it if you cut it for hay. <laughs> so it's got a high concentration of, of condensed tannins um, that reduced intake and digestibility. But um, there's, there's things that we can do to, you know, they've, they've read lower tannin types, that, but there's also, you know, we're finding value to that tannin now. That, that, that's what's giving it the anthemintic effect. And so sun drying reduces or improved intake and digestibility. And then we had lower tannin cultivars that were developed. Yeah. You, sh uh, you shift the, it from extractable forms to protein bound forms. And so that's, um, you know, I, I went to New Zealand, we, we developed a way to, to analyze for protein bound tannin, and that's basically what was happening. You know, when I was at Georgia, it's basically the tannin disappeared and we didn't know what happened to it. <laughs> but it's, so I think it's probably less reactive in, you know, with their saliva and things, so they don't, you know, it doesn't affect intake as much. But there's some discussion now as to what happens then. You know, does it stay bound? To protein or does it re-release inside the animal and you know because it's still effective and I'll show you some you know, data and information on that and so that's that's an ongoing question is what happens to the tannin you know what form is it in and what how does that affect its activity you know its bioactivity what is this? Oh, so, so uh, hi Tannin as adequate nutrition as pasture and hay for beef cows and calves. Uh, similar animal performance to Bermuda grass. Uh, it's not recommended to graze growing calves. Uh, cattle and sheep are, are grazed on AU low tan in South Africa. There's a, there's a farmer down there that's, that's got 20,000 acres of this stuff. And he's, you know, his, his sheep are trained to it and his cattle are trained to it. And so. But, but once it's dried, uh, the hay and the pellets are readily consumed by all classes of livestock and even exotic hoof stop, hooks, hoof stop. You know, things like uh, zoo, zoological animals like gazelle and black buck and, and so forth. Goats in particular will, will readily graze high tannin CT. Uh, sheep graze it after an adjustment period, as maybe a long adjustment period as somebody was mentioning earlier today. But like I say, that if you keep it low, you'll increase the, uh, the palatability. It's adequate nutrition for older animals. Um, it's good nutrition as a short-term feed for wean, lambs, and kids. And I'll, I'll show you data on this, that it's, it's highly effective against coccidia and against internal parasites, which is, so basically get them over that time when they're most, most stressed and susceptible to outbreaks of coccidia and so forth. Right now, we don't recommend going longer than eight weeks because uh, as we, um, there was some reduced gains compared to other feeds the longer you stayed on it. And so we just say, you know, switch to something else, you know, once they get past that danger period and then maybe come back to it as they get a little bit older. Some of the health benefits, all these tannin containing legumes are uh, anti-bloat, uh, there's been uh, some or at least one paper that showed it reduced somatic cell count in goat milk, and it has anti-parasitic effects. Yes, ma'am. Have your studies shown that there's been a decrease in lactation when it's in bed with lactating goats? Um, I haven't done nearly as much. 
it's, I mean, like I say, it's, it's not a magic feed. You know, it, it's, it, it'll, you know, depends on what you're comparing it to. It, it doesn't, you know, they, these, these tannins replace, you know, I mean, it could be 10, 15% tannin, so it replace protein and other things. And so, you know, I think that's part of it is that it's a, it's not a, it's not for the highest producing dairy cows. Uh, you know, it's, it's more of a medium quality feed. And so it'll, it'll produce like, like Bermuda grass would, or, you know, it's, there's nothing in the tannin itself that, that would produce, that would reduce um, the milk. And so it's just, just based on forage quality. And actually I found this in a, uh, a book on Chinese medicine that it was used historically for all these different things in, in humans. And so it's, it's been around for a long, long time and used for a lot of different things. And the one that kind of struck me is this one right here. As, ascariasis, you know, that, that it may have potential for maybe a third world application for, you know, p people that are exposed to parasites now. Some of the other benefits, uh, lower ruminal methane production, which is a, uh, um, you know, a greenhouse gas, uh, reduced urinary losses of nitrogen, and also kills house flies and animal feces. And all of this, uh, we believe, is due to its, its tannins. And, and I did want to talk just a little bit about tannin um, in general because I don't want you to give the impression that, you know, to control parasites or anything else, you just have to have a plant with tannins. That's not true. You know, we're, this, this work was with, with, a, with a particular type of plant with a particular type of tannin, and not all tannins are the same. But they are polyphenolic compounds. Um, the cell vacuoles and leaves accumulate these polyphenolics, uh, also called proanthocyanidins. The ones in Lespedeza have a very high concentration of what's called prodelphinidin type tannins. And I really don't want to get into a lot of chemistry because I'm not good at it, but also, uh, uh, but, but my, my biochemist colleagues have said, most of these tannins are a combination of either prodelphinidin and procyanidin in a repeating ratio. And this prodelphinidin has is a little more reactive. It has an extra OH group on one of its side chains or whatever. And so they've shown that, that the more of the prodelphinidin there is, the more anthemitic bioactivity there is. And this one has up to 98%. This is uh, just some data. When you're talking about tannins, you need to think about the concentration. In this case, the leaves are about 16%, much higher than the stems. And that's why we're trying to focus on the leaves and making the pellets. And I think these were leaf meal pellets. But you also have to look at the structure. The leaves were 98% prodelphinidin. And, and this, this was a mean degree of polymerization. It shows how big the, the, the molecule is. So it, it binds with protein. And so the bigger it is, it, it seems to fit better with protein. So it's, it's a very reactive kind of um, pr uh, tannin. That's, uh, there's certainly enough for it to react with itself, but I'm also doing some work with, I mean, there's other species where there's too much protein. And like when you ensile alfalfa or something, you know, a lot of it's broken down into non-protein, you know, ammonia and things like that. And so we're, we're looking at combining it to see if it'll preserve protein from other sources. And so that's uh, another potential area of research anyway. But th this is just to show some of the differences of, uh, like, birds for trefoils, uh, you know, less than 5%, big trefoil, j just that there's differences in concentration and there's differences in composition, and this affects its reactivity and how well it controls parasites and, and other things. Uh, these are the condensed tannins. It also varies based on the cultivar. The plant part is higher in leaves than stems. Plant maturity, leafy versus reproductive growth. Um, generally, in the summertime, it goes up a little bit. I don't know if the, if the plant is more stressed, um, causing it to, you know, kind of a, have a, uh, an increase in the, in the tannins. And that's, that's one of the, the things, too, about when Chris was talking about doing some of the fertility studies, what effect that has on the tannins, because it may actually reduce the tannin content. So we'll, we'll have to find that balance 
you know, what's, what's the best level from a bioactivity standpoint. Also processing method, like I say, each of these kind of seems to, uh, as, as Chris mentioned a, a minute ago, affect the form, not actually the, 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 um, the actual structure of it, but it, it determines if it's extractable or bound to, pr to protein or something else, which could affect its, uh, its activity. So the anthelmintic effects of condensed tannins in Lespedes are associated with their ability to form complexes with both plant and parasite proteins. You know, they're, they, they bind to proteins. And so what we think is happening with these um, parasites is that they're basically coating them so they can't move. And whether it's the eggs or the larvae or the adults, uh, it, Lespedes actually affects all three stages. And so there's also indirect effects, which has to do with the, the, the bypass protein increasing flow of amino acids to the small intestine, which kind of gives the animal a nutrition boost, which allows it to deal with the parasites better. And that's kind of the indirect effect, but, but the, most of our um, evidence so far has been for direct effects, that it's actually a, attacking the parasite. And this is just kind of a, uh, an electron micrograph that we took uh, from a study where animals were fed 75% leaf meal versus a control, and this is the, uh, the end of the parasite, and you can just tell of, of the ones that, that, that still survived, because a bunch died. Um, it, was, it looked like it was just not able to feed or something. You know, it was, it, we, we don't know exactly how it's doing it, but this parasite looks a lot, un, lot unhappier than this parasite. <laughs> But um, so that there's been, we've been doing this work now for probably the last you know, 10 or 12, even 15 years. And so there's, there's quite a few studies now that show, uh, that kind of started with grazing work in Oklahoma. They had a 50% reduction in gastrointestinal nematode egg counts in does grazing Lespedeza compared with, with tall fescue pasture. They had lower numbers of adult worms in tracer kids, and these are kids that are, uh, that they deworm them and then they put them out to let them pick up pa uh, parasites and compare them to the control. And so there was a, a big reduction in actual live number of, of adults, adult larvae. And this is just to show that it, isn't, it wasn't just a one-time thing and it wasn't just one species that uh, we've had positive results with grazing trials in North Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Uh, we did a lot of work in South Africa with different animal species, with different breeds and different ages, from pre-weaned, weaned animals to Spanish uh, boar cross, uh, uh, goats, and with different cultivars of Lespedeza. This is AU grazer, which is said is a medium tannin, uh, AU low tan. The, the other cultivars, particularly the higher tannin, older ones, really haven't been tested. And so we're, we're starting to grow those now because you know, they kind of fell out of favor previously, but you know, now there may be a, a market for them you know, if, if they have this, uh, this anthematic potential. Uh, grazing is generally limited to late spring, summer, and early autumn in areas where it's adapted. And so other, other ways to preserve it, uh, by ensiling it, sun drying it, processing it into leaf meal and pellets, gives farmers flexibility and the use of uh, Lespedes on farm, facilitates storage and transport, uh, generates, but it also, when you dry it and you process it, it, it generates heat, which reduces the extractable tannin content, which is what we were talking about earlier, and it increases the tannin bound to protein. So the question is, does this affect its anti-parasitic properties. And when we first did this, we thought it certainly would. And we were uh, pleasantly surprised when we first did the first study with hay. This was a study I done about 10 years ago now with, with hay. As soon as we introduced the Lespedeza, it was about an 80% drop and it stayed low. This is compared to Bermuda grass and these were uh, balanced for protein and energy. The, the diets, I, th I think it was about 75% of the diet was, was the, the forage. But there was an 80% drop, and it stayed there through the rest of the trial. 
Um, this, this was showing the percentage of the, of the eggs that actually developed into larvae. And there was a reduction of those that were treated with Lespedeza. And so the, the eggs were not as viable in developing into larvae. And this is the adult worms. Humuncus is the main one, the, the blood worm. And there was about a 70% less number of actual adults. And for a biological product, that's extraordinary. You know, I mean, when we first saw this, we thought, well, we must have misplaced a decimal point or something. Because it was about three times higher than most of what's in the literature. But, uh, and I'll, and I'll, I think now we have the answer because of this, this uh, thing with the predolphinidin, that it's a very unique type of tannin, which is why it's so very effective. It's also effective against astratasia, which is more of a cattle um, parasite, a cool season, and trichostrongulus. These are actually uh, significant differences, just not as spectacular as the, uh, as the difference in Hemuncus. This was a study looking at pelleted Ceresia versus ground Ceresia and ground Bermuda grass. And the pelleted actually did even a little bit better than the ground uh, Lespedeza. And I think this was because the, the goats ate it better. And a lot of these studies, have, have, you know, I keep talking about goats because I, I, that's mainly what I've done. But my other colleagues have done it uh, with sheep at Louisiana and Arkansas and places like that. And so basically everything I'm showing you with goats also applies to sheep. And this is just some very recent work with uh, uh, silage of Lespedeza. It wasn't quite as low, but uh, this, there was no difference really here. But both uh, the SL hay and the SL silage reduced um, fecal egg count. Uh, this is nematode egg count compared to the control. And uh, hay trials have been done at various places, done with sheep, cattle, llamas. I mean. Lots of different species. Um, pellet experiments have been done with different species as well in, in different locations. And uh, we've, we've done several different pellet trials looking at coccidia as well. And I'll show you some of that data here shortly too. But the bottom line is that drying and processing Lespedeza does not seem to reduce its antiparasitic effectiveness, which is wonderful news because it just really, to me, it opens up a whole new industry. And, and that's what Sims Brothers is now marketing uh, anthemintic pellets here in Virginia. And I, I, I know that they're popular in Virginia because they can't keep up with demand. They're, they're starting to sell it through like uh, organic feed stores and things like that. So other questions about the antiparasitic properties of Lespedeza? How much is needed to achieve the antiparasitic effect? What parasite is it most effective against? And then this is the same question with the drugs and everything else is, you know, will it last? You know, will, will the effect last? And is there potential for uh, um, resistance? So this is a study we did with whole plant Lespedeza, uh, leaves and stems. And essentially what we found was that uh, you needed 50% or more to really get the, the reduction in uh, fecal egg count. 25% was a little bit lower, but not s significantly lower than control. Um, we've, we then did a study with, this was only 25% of the ration, with leaves versus the whole plant. And we, we, we just repeated this study, and I think we're going to find similar results that both of them brought egg counts down, but the leaf meal brought it down faster, which makes sense because you know, the leaf meal, leaf meal is higher in, in tannins. And again, these, these rations were balanced for, pro, for protein and energy. Oh, yes? Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's just what we. You know, we, we, these were done in confinement. You know, we don't know exactly like what percentage of the diet it needs to be under grazing conditions, but um, and we don't know, you know, like uh, this. This uh, I'll show you in the next slide. The, the, it's even more effective against coccidia, 
So we think it could, could go even lower than 25% of the diet and still get a good effect with coccidia. And so right now we're saying, based on our data, if you can get 25 to 50% of their diet as Lespedeza, either grazing or whatever, that, that should be enough to get good parasite control. But it may, you know, some is better than none. Um, by far, the mo it's most... Most effectiveness is against Haemonchus contortus, which is our biggest problem, the blood worm. It's the biggest problem worldwide. And it's, Haemonchus is now being found in Canada and Finland and Alaska and places where it, you know, it's a tropical worm, but it's spreading all over the world. And so, you know, what, what, I mean, we actually started off 10 years ago or so as the Southern Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control and now we're the American consortium because the problems are spreading west and north and pretty soon we'll be the international consortium. <laughs> but as I said, it also has some effect against Trichostrongulus, which is not a blood feeder. Humuncus is a blood feeder. That's why it's so, uh, such a big problem. Um, Tula dressages, neither one of these are blood feeders, but they do, they do uh, reduce productivity. And so it does have a, uh, some effectiveness against those two. But far and away, uh, this is Haemonchus contortus. That's the biggest problem. Unfortunately, it's the one that, that it's most effective against. And this was a study with uh, coccidia. And what we did here to get this big jump, we took kids directly from their mother in, in southern um, Georgia, put them directly into the study, you know, put them on, on a, you know, trucked them from southern Georgia for two or three hours, you know, put them into a pen and then started the trial, which basically increased their, their stress level extraordinarily high because we wanted to see if we could, we could get a coccidial outbreak. And we succeeded greatly. <laughs> this was the, uh, the control and this was the Lespedeza. So basically Lespedeza prevented that outbreak of coccidia, which is a, a big deal. You know, I mean, that's not just sheep and goats. Did you yes. feed them pellets or did you have them on a pen? This, this, this was pellets, gotcha. yeah, and so, um, and like I say, sheep take a little longer to get used to the pellets even. Yes, yes, sir. Who did you say sells the pellets? I'll show you that it's, it's Sims Brothers Seed Company, and I'll, I'll uh, later here in the talk, I'll, you, can, you can write their information down. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Do, do, do you get it from Sims Brothers? Do you get it from Sims Brothers? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're, and, you know, I tell farmers anywhere that they need people growing this stuff and, and, and giving them raw material to make pellets because they, they can't keep up with the demand. And there's a waiting list, and, they, you know, it's, so it's an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about that much here, but uh, um, in like we, we did, a, it was similar. I mean, it was actually better than Bermuda grass in the in the goat study we did. Um, but others, you know, it, it depends on what which animals you're feeding it to, and, and so forth. You know, it's it's a good quality forage, but it's not like alfalfa, or you know, it's but it's um, it does well with with small ruminants. You know, we had, I think the one study, growth study we did with, with kids, we got you know, 100 to 120 grams per day compared to about 80 grams per day for the, the Bermuda grass. But that, of course, that varies depending on what percentage of the diet and so forth. And, and that's part of our challenge right now is to figure out what's an optimal level nutritionally compared to an optimal level for controlling parasites. But, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, there's no perfect feed and there's no perfect forage. You know, that's why I really enjoyed the talks earlier. You know, this should be viewed as, as a supplement to whatever else you're doing. And, you know, and I like to talk to farmers to see, you know, what level they're feeding and, and what kind of a result they're getting. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Right. They don't need right. Have more. So if you see that on the feed tag, take that with a grain of salt. 
Yeah, Sim, Sims Brothers is a very conservative, uh, that they, they want to make sure they get good results. And that, that's why I like to talk to farmers that say, you know, I'll, you know I fed it at 10% or whatever, you know, that's, and, and see what kind of, but in talking with Sims Brothers, and, and you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but, but they said they've gotten very few comments, negative comments about the pellets. And so that's, so that's pretty unusual. And so that's encouraging too. Did you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah. I read something about diatomaceous earth being a control for um, uh -huh. a is that uh, This is a question about DE or diatomaceous earth. And uh, we get this question all over the world. We, we were in South Africa last year and there were somebody with, I think, was trying to sell some. To my knowledge, there's never been a scientific paper that showed that DE controlled parasites. I think it helps with fly control and some other things, but it's. And I know it's, it's very popular. Yes, Dahlia? Oh, five minutes. Okay, I thought you had a question. <laughs> yeah, I get started talking. It takes a while. Man. But anyway, this, 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 was, uh, this is very exciting because, you know, coccidia is a problem with calves and pigs and chickens. And, you know, so it kind of opens up a, a whole new area of, of research for us. This was... Uh, um, this was silage, and so it had a very similar effect uh, with, with, with the pellets and with silage on coccidia. So the question is, can parasites develop resistance? Um, animals do adapt to a high tannin diet. They, they increase their production of this uh, proline-rich saliva, which kind of binds tightly to the tannin. There's some increased production of tannin-degrading protein. Um, and there were some recent results from a colleague in Arkansas so that, that it was not as effective against sheep and goats in Arkansas. But I took the same pellets and they were effective against in, in both uh, nematodes and coccidia in Georgia. And so there may be a regional thing going on. We're not really sure exactly what was going on with that. Uh, just, you were saying, you know, why would it, why would it not work in, as well in Arkansas? Um, it may have to do with the infection level if it, if it wasn't a primary humongous infection, then it probably wouldn't be as effective. If the pellets got overheated, which Sims Brothers said one batch, it did get too hot. And so that, you know, that there's, there is a limit as to how much you can heat them. And this is just uh, what we were talking about earlier. We recommend 50% or more, but you can probably get by with a little bit lower and, and you know, and what's practical for your situation. We also say to supplement energy or protein needs uh, for specific classes of animals. For uh, young kids and lambs, for to control coccidia or barber pole worm, we recommend feeding two weeks prior to the, to the period of stress, such as uh, um, moving the animals or weaning or, or you know, something that, that normally triggers the outbreak of coccidia or um, the worm outbreak. And then to continue for about six weeks afterwards. And also save it for your most susceptible animals, kids and lambs at weaning, does and ewes during the uh, parturition period or an early lactation. Uh, we, did, we have seen a little bit of, or some evidence that uh, over time, there seems to be a reduced trace minerals, and we're not sure exactly what that means yet, but that doesn't seem to be a problem with older animals. But it seems we've, we've seen it some with the young kids and lambs. Just to reiterate this point again, it's not a silver bullet for parasite control. It should be used in conjunct conjunction with, with FAMACHA, which I'm sure you all have, are familiar with, copper oxide, uh, other management. You know, it's, it's just one tool in the toolbox for sustainable parasite control. This is the website, acsrpc.org, or wormx.info. And this is just loaded with all kinds of information on parasite control. There's a lot of, there's a, under the topics thing at that website, there's one on Cerisia lespedeza, how to establish it, all the, you know, all of the uh, extension papers that have been put out on, you know, on its general utilization, as well as its use for parasite control.
This is some of our uh, future research, uh, grazing trials in combination with other forages. Um, SL is a deworming paddock. You know, I have, I have farmers tell me they do that. They just rotate animals when they get sick. And I don't know if it's, you know, they say they look better after a couple weeks, but uh, that may just be that, you know, they're perking up without actually killing the parasites. I, I think it takes a little bit longer to kill the parasites, but, we, but it's still a researchable thing. And then research with, uh, as dried or ensiled feeds, as an ingredient in complete feeds, as a component, as a total mixed ration, what we were talking about. And then all these other animals that, uh, that we haven't done a whole lot of research with that have the similar parasites as sheep and goats. And so it's likely got potential for them too. Okay. This is the, uh, the source, Sims Brothers Seed Company in Union Springs, Alabama. And so you can look up their website. Um, it's just simsbrothers.com, I think. I mean, or, or just Google it, and it'll come up. And I, I'm glad we have the, uh, the, the representative here that, uh, that sells their, their pellets. I didn't, didn't actually plan that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my opinion as to the potential for this plant. It's you know, particularly in Southern Africa and other parts of the world. And I mean, if, if we get into the pellet business, you can actually set, send them anywhere you want to. And so um, I think there's a lot more potential for farmers. I know there's a farmer now in South Carolina that's growing Lespedeza as for horse hay. And he was doing some of what Chris was talking about. He's increasing their fertility and, and, and you know, reducing the weeds so that he gets a very nice looking hay for, for horses. And he's just now testing it to see if it has any effect on horse parasites, which we, we don't really know yet. But How many cuttings is he getting? Normally we can get um, two really good cuttings you know, it, it, the further south, it, you can get a little bit. Here, you could probably get two good cu cuttings, or or possibly three. About the same season for. Pardon? About the same season for it for the normal hay. Uh, it, it's a it's a summer perennial, and so normally we get we get one in May, and then uh, again in July, and then maybe in September or something like that. Yes. I have not. Uh, my colleague in, in Reading, England, has done quite a bit of sandpoint work. And uh, it's a different type of tannin, but it, it's effective as well. And, and they've, they've made silage, and they've, they're trying to pellet it. And you know, they're, they're keenly interested in the work we're doing because, you know, we're, as far as the pellets, we're a little uh, ahead of them. But, uh, but it's got potential you know, in the western U.S. as well. Is, is it grown in, in Virginia? Do you know? Okay. So it's got sandpoint, it's got lespedeza, alfalfa. It's kind of got a, a number of different goods in it, but sandpoint and lespedeza are the two predominant ones. Sounds like a pretty good mix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yes? Annual lespedeza? Uh, we're, we're, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it, it is, it's a good forage, but as far as its tannin content and its bioactivity, we don't know yet. We're, we're growing some now to, to test some of that, because I, you know, I've had that question before, and I think it has some tannins, but not nearly as high as the perennial types. But it's a, you know, if it's got potential, we, we need to figure that out. Yes, ma'am. Um, we own a small field that I guess well, maybe was established in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And if I sang you a sample, could you tell me what kind of Lespedeza, like what cultivar it is, and, and what the potential for it would be? Well, I mean. I know it's not the latest one. Okay, it's it's probably. Um, I mean that the older types normally had. I mean, does it have? When it gets taller, do the bottom leaves fall off? I don't know. I'll check. Okay. I mean, we haven't. We we mowed it. I mean, we haven't let it grow yeah. tall. Most of the older types are what they call common lespedeza, which is. You know what? We haven't done a lot of work on that yet, but you know, I'm trying to to get some. So just some round bales. So if, if anybody, Chris, if, if, if we can find some, some round bales of, of Lespedeza from some of those, uh, you know, things over there in, in western, uh, southwestern Virginia, I'd love to run some tests on that because it's the same plant. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that, that it wouldn't be as effective. You know, maybe uh, nutritionally there might be uh, more challenges, but uh, maybe not. You know, it's, um, 
And that's, that's really something we're looking at now is going back to some of those older cultivars. I mean, if it's, if it's got the potential, I think it does, all those plants growing in the Midwest, you know, would go from a weed problem to a bonanza. You know, it, you know if, if there's somebody that's got the, the knowledge to go out and cut it and shake the leaves off or do what Sims Brothers is doing. So. <laughs> Any, uh, any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I, you're supposed to kind of pr press on the eyelid to get it to come out. I wasn't expecting him to do that, but that's, that's, what, he was, that's what he was actually doing, which is <laughs> um, I, I, I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 have, I have made less of these at tea, so, so just in case. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? All right, thanks.